something. I can't believe I'm 92, and, but I am. And uh, my father said to me, but he says, he said, when you're building your life, the most important things are the four L's. And the first L is listening. And that's what we do when we come to, to, to Jonesboro. We listen. We listen. And it's a rare thing these days, listening. Listening to the human voice. Listening to one person talking to another person. Listening. We have forgotten how to listen. How to sit down and talk and have a good time listening. My daddy said, listen. God gave you two ears and one mouth, and he expected you to use them in that proportion, which is a you know, good lesson. The first L is listening, and the next L is learning. You have to learn something different all your life. Don't ever quit learning, but listening and learning and laughing is the third L, he said. We've all got to laugh, laugh at ourselves, laugh at something every day. The world is a magical, wonderful place, he says. But we need to laugh together. Don't laugh at people, my father said. You laugh with people. And you can never hate anyone you've really laughed with. Laughter binds people together. The most important L is loving. Loving. That God put us here to love each other, to enjoy each other, to help each other, to laugh together, to learn together, to listen together, but to love each other. And there's nothing that says I love you more pleasantly and more plainly than storytelling. Everybody here has stories that you need to tell. You need to tell to somebody you love. And now is the time to do it. Go home and tell stories. And tell each one with love, ending with, I love you. That was Catherine Tucker Windham speaking at the 2010 Alabama Storytelling Festival at the age of 92 about the importance of stories. I'm Amy Antonucci. I'm glad to be with you tonight and welcome you to True Tales Radio, coming live from WSCA's West End Studio, 909 Islington Street in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. True Tales Radio is a place for local people to come and share their own true stories with our listeners and audience, and to come and be part of this, your local independent community radio station that we're so lucky to have here in Seacoast, New Hampshire. Tonight we have six storytellers on the theme of being different. We also want to welcome the crew from and the viewers of Portsmouth Public Media Television, PPM-TV. The crew is here taping tonight so that you all can watch later um, True Tales TV on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. on Channel 98, or you can stream it at ppmtvnh.org slash live. We want to thank our underwriters for tonight's program, Jan Hansen, who believes in the unique value of having an independent community radio station in the Seacoast, Pat Spaulding, who believes in stories for grown-ups on True Tales Radio, and is curious to know Hey, what's your story? And Emily Spaulding, author of Red Clay Girl, who believes that when you share your story, you never know who you might touch. So here's how tonight's show will go. Each of our six storytellers will be introduced to you by Pat, and then we'll share a true story from their life. Everyone has 10 minutes for their telling. There's no rating system, there's no grading, this is uh, collaborative and cooperative rather than competitive, a chance for us to be together as a community. And I'm now going to pass the mic over to Pat, and she'll introduce our first storyteller to you. Welcome. Thanks, Amy. 
Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hey, <laughs> glad to be here tonight with some fine storytellers, not including myself, of course. Um, first off, we're going to start with Kathy Boss. She lives in Wilton, New Hampshire. Kathy is a writer, teacher, poet, and performer who is always up for a challenge. When she was a kid, she tells us she had her own frequent flyer card at the local hospital. If the universe was trying to slow her down, it didn't succeed, and to date, still hasn't had much effect. Tonight, Kathy will tell us her story, Chasing Normal. Come on up, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Good. So this is a story that's been wanting to come out for a while, and it's having a little difficulty, but hopefully it'll get there. When I was in first grade in Harriet's Field, Nova Scotia, Canada, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Sangster, washed my mouth out with soap. <laughs> See, she'd heard a, another kid, not me, I swear, <laughs> swearing on the playground, and she assumed it was me. I was different than other kids. By the time I was six years old, I had already lived in three different countries, and I'm not sure how many homes. My parents had moved to Nova Scotia a year before, both Americans, from Australia, where I had been born and lived for five years. I was the kind of kid who couldn't sit still and moved around all over the place, had bandages, and at least one broken bone already. I was also the little girl who, when she asked people, what do you want to be when you grow up, said, I want to be a doctor, which was not the right answer because only boys become doctors, according to Mrs. Sangster. So this moment in time, given my sort of different upbringing up to that point, could have been a moment when I began to chase normal, when I said, okay, it's just not worth the hassle of being different and I, I want to fit in and I'm going to be a good girl. But that wasn't what happened. When I went home that night, my family, instead of getting upset with me or calling the school or putting me back in school the next day, and this was 1970, decided to do something that was practically unheard of at the time. They pulled me out of school and I was homeschooled for the next eight years. Very different from all the other kids in our neighborhood, I can tell you. Instead of being in a classroom, we climbed trees, my sister and I. We learned about frogs because we went down to the pond and we picked pollywogs out and saw the different stages that, that they were at. We read books together. We learned about math by reading Flatland and making recipes, and we learned about history by going to museums. It was a really wonderful and magical way to grow up, and a very different way to grow up. And it wasn't all perfect, of course. We did make friends at the Girl Guides and the YMCA and places like that. But my parents got divorced when I was around nine. We moved around a lot still. And when I was 12, I was sort of getting fed up and having that sort of puberty, I want to fit in thing that we all get, right? And so I... Are you wearing turquoise makeup? My mother called it sleazy. <laughs> so I smoked my first menthol cigarette and last one. I stole a candy bar on a dare and all three of us kissed the local boy. <laughs> so that moment in time was like so many other kids an experiment, right, in trying to fit in. And I think it probably would have ended within a couple of years. But something happened in my life that thrust me into chasing normal for a very, very long time. My mother was single, and a man came into our lives. And he was charming and lovely, and one of those kinds of people who had this 
glow of spirituality and artistry about him. And he loved the fact that we were homeschooled, and he loved us girls. We sold everything we owned just because it wasn't enough. settled down on the West Coast, there was a night when my mother and sister weren't there. And this is still in this stage where I'm trying so hard to fit in. And he came into my room while they were, not, while they were out. And in that moment, this person you trust, this person who's brought love into your house, who your mother has trusted, this happens to way too many of us, and it's part of the reason I want to tell the story that slices your life. And that childhood, that magic, was replaced by this pain and this shame of this moment. And the pain and the shame pressed down on the magic. And all I wanted to do from then on was to be normal. What I thought was normal. And this time my mother and father were not there to rescue me. This time they weren't there to thrust me into a new magical world like they had after Mrs. Sangster. This time I had to make it in the world on my own. And for reasons I can't quite explain, I ended up staying on the West Coast and my mother ended up on the East Coast and I stayed with a host family who I was so impressed by in their normalcy. They were so normal. They ate dinner together. They'd lived in the same house all their lives. Looking back on it, the white Afro wig and dancing, two men at work, maybe not so normal. <laughs> but it gave me something to aspire to. <laughs> so I was running away from the magic because of this moment of violation. And unlike moving from difference into normality, which could happen like that because the tide of the mainstream is so damn strong, right? It was not so easy to move out of the mainstream again. I went to a public high school. I went to Boston University, met a man from Long Island who had lived in the same house all his life, who, had be, who ended up becoming my sort of guardian of normalcy. So when I kind of went off the beaten track, he was happy to pull me back in and make sure I didn't go too far. Because to me, that was still very scary. That was still part of what had happened. That was still tied up with the trauma. And it, it's hard work getting over something like that. It's hard work getting back to that magic that you had before some trauma like that happens in your life. I had three children, and they were my inspiration to keep working. Three sons. You know, and I think having sons was a huge thing for me. And I had to get to the point where I could heal and be there for them. And it took probably going to this world of difference where I started working at this little school where the kind of childhood I had, they were all having. You know, they were all, the kids were out doing stuff, they were making stuff, they were, it was becoming the norm. And I was like, whoa, wait, I could have normal, right? I started going to yoga and the new agey stuff that terrified me with this man who had violated our entire family, not just me. That new age sort of spirituality suddenly had a new home in me. I could suddenly embrace it again. And it was a slow, slow process 
of finding my way back to some sort of healing. I wish I could, in that uh, part of my struggle with figuring out how to tell the story is how do you tell it so that it's clear there's no one event where, oh, whoops, I'm healed. It's this process, this story. And so maybe my healing in this is that this is the first time ever that I have told anybody about the night that this man came into my room and tried to take away my normal. And he didn't. It might have taken him 30 years. But this is my story. It's not my mother's story. It's not his story. This is my story. And anybody else who's gone through this, it's so easy to keep this story inside. But, you, but we don't have anything to be ashamed of. And that's my story. I'm tired of being ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Brave and beautifully told. Nancy Brown is coming up next. Uh, she raised her children in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and she still lives here. She's been a local activist since the mid-60s. A teacher all her life, Nancy worked with the War on Poverty in Appalachia and as a Peace Corps volunteer in Central America. She has taught in many different settings, from Mayan villages to Exeter Academy. Recently, Nancy retired, but she is still teaching something her family never believed she could do. This is her original family. We'll find out more about that in her story, Little Did I Know. Come on up, Nancy. This is the first time Nancy has told. Are we okay? Hi, good evening. Um, my, the title of my little story is Little Did I Know. Um, and I, it's a, a conversation that I had with a teacher in high school was about to change my life forever. And that's what this story is about. It was in the early 60s in Wisconsin, and I was nearly halfway through my senior year in high school. Um, I truly enjoyed school. I loved my friends, um, most but not all of my teachers I loved. And I, I truly loved engaging and learning in the classroom. One afternoon in school, Miss Clark, one of my favorite teachers, stopped me for the second time in a week to ask questions of me. I was standing next to my locker. I was pulling a book out, ready to run down the hall for my next class. So, Nancy, have you decided to go to college? Are you considering it? What do you think you're going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your future? After you graduate from here, where are you going? What are you doing? Are you thinking about college? You know, there are many good colleges in our state. I smiled and I returned her greeting and her enthusiasm. And I said, look, even if I wanted to go to college, how could I possibly do it? You know, both of my parents work in factories. I have three siblings. How could I possibly ever do it? Ms. Clark looked directly at me. You do it yourself, Nancy. You do it yourself. First, you have to make a decision. If you decide that you're going to go to college, then you figure out a way to do it. I was laughing, kind of nodding my head, lightheartedly listening to what she said. So tell me, tell me, Miss Clark, how could I possibly do it? Tell me. How? You figure it out, Nancy. I know you are capable. If you decide to do something, you figure it out. She watched as I shut the locker door, ran down the hall into the classroom, closing the door behind me as class had just started. Over the next few days, I couldn't stop thinking about what Ms. Clark said to me. Her words resonated. I lay awake at night, imagining going off to college, imagining a life in a classroom. Do it myself? Do it myself? How could I do it myself? It was January, the heart of winter, and I had just turned 18. Both my parents were in the kitchen. My brother and sister were in the living room, and I could hear the TV playing. I felt over-anxious, excited, speeding around from counter to sink to the table, from counter to the table to the sink. And then I stopped, and I looked at Mom and Dad. 
I said, Mom, Dad, look, I have something I need to tell you. I, I need to talk with you just for a few minutes. I, I just want you to know I made a decision. I've been thinking about this, and I decided that I, I want to go to college. I would like to be a teacher. I, can you believe I'm thinking about that? I'd like to be a teacher. And after much thought, I just thought, I, I, I know this is really what I want to do, and I can do it. I'm going to go to college. So... He, my father didn't know what to say. My mom looked at him and then directly at me and in a really stern look on her face, which was not uncommon. You want to do what? Go to college? You want to go to college? Who do you think you are? You think you're better than us? You think that you're going to raise yourself above your learning? Just who do you think you are? And I remember standing there, noticing, like, my father didn't say a word. My mom was clearly upset. She was enraged to a degree. It was a painful, difficult moment. I looked at Dad and Mom, and then I said, look, look, I'm not any better than you. I, I'm who you are. I'm the same. I just want to study to be a teacher. It won't be easy. I'll have to work hard. I'll have to figure it out. I, I, uh, I know it will be a challenge. I'll have to, I know I'll have to work. I, I'm not asking for any money. I know I wouldn't ask you for any money. I'll figure this out. I have to. My mom raised her voice some. You can work it out by yourself? You're going to figure this out all by yourself? Well, we'll see. We'll see just how you're going to figure this out. She kept repeating herself, obviously not pleased. And then she stopped and did not speak to me for the rest of the night. Not another word. I could feel her pain, her anger, her anguish, and I knew how hard she worked. I knew my mother's life was not easy. When I got home from school the next day, late afternoon, the back door was locked, and all my belongings were in the backyard. Everything from the house, all my clothes, my shoes, books, my one pair of boots, stuff from my dresser drawers, everything from the closet, everything was out in the backyard and I was not allowed in the house. And the message from my mother, now go. Find your own way. Go. See what you can do on your own. Figure it out. Just go. I stood there for what seemed like forever, like frozen. I remember standing there in the backyard. And then I thought, well, I'll call two of my friends. I, I guess I, I know I have to figure this out. So I called Tanya and Susie, two of my dear friends, Asked them if they'd come and pick me up. They knew that there were difficulties in my life. Then we called my grandmother. They helped me do that, who lived with my aunt and uncle several miles away. I told them what happened and asked if I could come and stay there, but I was going to be bringing all of my belongings. They said, sure, come, come. My friends drove me to Grandma Annie's, and I moved in. Now it was February, and I had five more months of high school. I caught the early bus every morning and made it to school each day. It was quite a different in terms of the distance I had to go. Um, before that time, I would walk to school with my friends every day, and that was just wonderful memories of us meeting each other on the corners and walking to school together. Um, I continued to work at the local pharmacy after school, and um, because I was taking that city bus, um, and I was away from my family, I mean, I really missed my friends in that respect. And I missed my family living at home, being in my neighborhood. But I was grateful to live with my Grandma Annie and my Aunt Mary and my Uncle Jer. They were kind. They were very supportive. During those last months of high school, I followed through with everything necessary, applying for college. I even got a small loan to get through the first year. I was overjoyed when I got the letter saying I was accepted. I also borrowed money from a dear Uncle Len, who passed away recently, and I promised her, I remember saying, Uncle Len, I will pay back every cent you loan me, but you have to give me a little time, because I have to graduate, get a job, and then I will start paying you back. Well, in June, I graduated from high school, worked that summer, and prepared to leave for college. The first week of September, my Aunt Pat drove 300-plus miles to college. It was far from home. 
I was overwhelmed, grateful, joyful, scared, excited, never ever thought that I would do this, but I worked it out. I graduated in 1967 and became a teacher for the next 38 years, and I'm still doing some teaching. Only a couple of days a week, that's all I can do. Never thought that would be my life. My dad and my brother and sister stayed in contact with me. Years later, my mom and I made peace and became friends again. May I always continue to learn to help myself and to help others to believe that they are capable. Thank you. The time is 6.57. You are listening to True Tales Radio, broadcasting from Portsmouth Community Radio, 106.1 FM, uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 909 Islington Street. Um, and I'm Amy Antonucci. We're listening to some very powerful stories tonight. And we're going to keep on with that. Here comes Pat back to introduce our next storyteller. Thank you. Thanks for that really inspirational story, Nancy. That was great. First time. First time teller. Next up, we have Sylvia Olson. She has lived in six different states, and she likes the new ones best. New Jersey, New York, New Hampshire. While working in western New York, she devoted much of her life to public service and social justice. Today, she's relaxing in New Hampshire, climbing mountains, walking the beach, writing short stories and novels about her true life experiences and the people that she came to know. Tonight, we'll hear about some of those experiences in her story titled, Different Cultures. Come on up, Sylvia. It's good. This is a puzzler. I'm white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. But I'm not a wasp. What am I? Take a guess. Okay, for those of you who don't know, a wasp is an American of English descent, possibly Scots, but not Irish. And for anyone who already knows what a wasp is, most of you are saying, well, so what? Who cares? We're all Americans. What difference does it make? The answer to the puzzler is this. My ancestors came from the original Angle land, which is an area near the elbow of Denmark and Germany, and from Dresden, a German city located in what was once the Kingdom of Saxony. My family had been Lutheran Protestant since 1520, and I also have a Norwegian grandfather. No English that I know of, but I'm white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant. In America, however, that often means that I am somehow magically transformed into being English. But I am no more English than someone who is Polish, Hungarian, or Russian, or Italian or Greek. Maybe it isn't really important. But there are lots of people who can never become a wasp, like I can. I can fake it. I can pass. <laughs> if I was Chinese or African American or Sri Lankan, I couldn't. As a little girl, I remember being disappointed to learn that I was not descended from the pilgrims. We'd make pilgrim hats out of construction paper, little pilgrim figures, and then put them up as Thanksgiving decorations. But we were never pilgrims. No, my family were wagon train pioneers who lived in lo real log cabins out on the prairie. We survived droughts, blizzards, and tornadoes, plagues of grasshoppers, and Sioux uprisings. If there was a TV series about us, they'd have to use subtitles. We were speaking German and Norwegian, not English. We were Mayflower Minnesotans, some of the first European settlers in Minnesota territory. This was a culture of hard living where women had no time to play with their hair or, God forbid, put on makeup. A dumb, pretty woman was useless, and only a stupid man would marry her. <laughs> Through the miracles of being American, I lived in New Jersey when I was little. This was only 15 years after the end of World War II, and almost everyone's dad had been in the service, and so was mine. And who were we fighting? The Germans, the enemy. So I had to keep quiet about who I was, 
and take advantage of passing as a wasp, even though I didn't understand that much. But my face gave me away with my high cheekbones, my almond-shaped eyes, my peach-toned skin, rosebud lips, and page boy haircut. I looked like a blue-eyed blonde Chinese girl. These were classic Scandinavian and Central European features, but I didn't know it. Kids teased me and called me a chink. I asked my mom why I looked Chinese, and uh, she said mysteriously, that's the tartar in you. I didn't know who the tartars were or how they got inside of me, and I didn't, I didn't ask. It was a big secret. I grew up in the suburbs of New York City, a friendly place where everyone was from someplace else, and when I was nine, we moved to western New York, a different New York, small town and almost rural, and if you were from someplace else, you might never belong. Passing as a wasp was no big deal. No one cared. The girl culture of my high school required acting dumb, being obsessed with hair, makeup, clothes, and boys, none of which I really gave a crap about, uh, nothing that my nice Lutheran background prepared me for. I could barely pass as a girl, being obsessed with getting good grades and reading books. Fast forward a few years. When I got out of college, passing as a wasp was still not important because I was a woman. Back then, when we still had want ads, they were divided up into two sections in the newspaper. The first section had a little stick figure wearing pants with all the good paying professional jobs. And the second section had a stick figure wearing a skirt. And these were all the clerical childcare teaching and cleaning jobs that didn't pay so well. Since I never worked out particularly well in the culture of women, I wasn't sure what to do. Finally, I got a temporary government job. I was a social caseworker aide in the utility shutoff program, adult services. I made home visits to folks who were behind in their gas and electric bills, way behind. Energy costs skyrocketed back in the 70s and took everyone by surprise. You might remember this, some of you folks out there. These folks claimed that if their gas and electric was shut off, that would cause them a medical emergency their insulin or antibiotics would go bad, or they die of asthma without air conditioning. In the summer, of course. No heat in a western New York winter would definitely cause a medical emergency for just about anyone. They would just freeze to death. At social services, I joined a staff of five other people. I was the token white girl. There were three black women, a black man, and a P Puerto Rican woman. Passing as a wasp was of no concern to my co-workers. All white people were pretty much the same to them. But they liked me. My hair wasn't straight and blonde anymore. It was wild and thick and impossibly curly, a kind of reddish brown. My eyes weren't blue either. Now they were green. I still had those full rosebud lips, and with a good tan, I looked interracial. <laughs> I had a black boyfriend. I passed. <laughs> a guy named Ken was in charge. He was white, too. After they got to know me, the other staff asked me, quite frankly, what was up with Ken? What a weird guy. How was it that he was married? Who would marry Ken? I didn't understand at first. There was nothing about Ken that was weird or mysterious. He was a pretty typical, educated, middle-class, socially inept white guy. The only mystery was that he was a social worker, he didn't seem to like people, so why social work? Maybe because IT hadn't been invented yet? <laughs> I guess in African-American culture, there weren't many guys like this. Socially awkward, quiet, reclusive guys. Guys in the hood were generally loud, talkative, friendly. Fighters, lovers, sometimes nuts, but their culture didn't include too many guys like Ken. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of folks of the Caucasian persuasion listening right now. You never knew you were mysterious, did you? Enigmatic, like the Sphinx. Well, you are. I had a friend who went to a suburban Catholic high school. He played football, he was a school champion. Went off to military school, then a small, almost Ivy private college. A community leader, active in the church, husband and father. Then he got a job as a dispatcher for the city's operations center. 
answering the phone, dealing with complaints, sending out work crews, garbage, snow plowing, burst water mains, down trees, roadkill. He was black. It was the only job he could find that paid well and had benefits. He grew up in the southwest section of the city. He never knew anyone from the northwest. Now he was with these guys every day. Waste management consultants everywhere. When he was home, it was the Cosby Show. At work, it was the Sopranos, minus the guns, the fights, and the mafia. But he was never sure about the mafia thing. The brother of the union president was killed in a car bombing a few years back. Anything was possible. These guys scared the crap out of my friend. He never heard anyone use the F word so often and so creatively. Um, he didn't know they existed, not in his city. The only white people he knew were nice Catholics and rich college kids, teachers, professors. He'd never met white guys who could pave streets all day, then go home and make pasta. Act like your best friend, then slash your tires if you did something to piss him off. It's easy for us to take our idea of our own culture for granted, like that's the only one that exists. It's the best one, that we don't even live in separate cultures, but we do. When my friend was telling me about the waste management consultants, I didn't think they were any weirder than my old boss, Ken. I went to high school with guys like that. After graduation, some of them went off to become attorneys, some stole cars. I explained to my friend there were different kinds of white people, different religions, histories, ethnicities. Italians, Germans, French, Scandinavians, and Slavs, the English, Scots, Welsh, and Irish, Czechs, Hungarians, Bulgarians, Russians. We looked different, ate different food, had different customs and attitudes. Then there were the Jews. They were accountants and allergists now, but in Europe, they took the blame for everyone's problems for centuries. And in Europe, we all hated each other. We're not over it yet in America, but we won't admit it. My friend was amazed. He knew blacks were different if, say, someone was from New Orleans or Florida or Virginia. He had no idea being white was so complicated. So many tribes, so much going on between us. He just assumed we were all friends and allies being white and oppressing black folk. One day, passing as a wasp really backfired. By this time, I was working at City Hall in human resources. I had an employee who claimed he was unable to bid on a job posting because his uncle died and he had to take care of all the funeral arrangements. His proof was a copy of the memorial service, but I was confused and called it a prayer card. I'm not Catholic. I don't know what they look like. I thought the guy was BSing me, so I turned the request down, and since this only covered the day of the funeral, not the four days the posting was up, and I sent this off in a memo to my boss per procedure. So Terry, my boss, calls me into his office. He proceeds to chew me out for rejecting the guy for being anti-Catholic. He was considering disciplining me <coughs> for religious discrimination. It was my cross to bear. As a wasp, I had to take the fall for Oliver Cromwell, the potato famine, and centuries of English oppression of the Irish. No matter that Terry was born and raised in Buffalo, he was still Irish, and he planned on wreaking vengeance upon me, a nice German-Norwegian Lutheran. <laughs> I couldn't defend myself. I couldn't go to HR and complain. We were HR. <laughs> so I sat there and took it like the German I was. Turned out I was right all along. Every single day the guy at the job was posted, the guy had punched in and worked his full eight hours. I saw a copy of his time card. Oh, yeah. The job postings were right next to the clock. There was no way he could have missed them. And after that, any time a union member missed a job posting, we sent the request for a waiver directly to the union president, Big Tony. We let him make the decisions. No one was messing with Tony G. Now, I live in Portsmouth. New Hampshire is packed full of wasps, and I pass all the time. People love books and being outdoors. Every day is casual Friday. Dressing up is wearing something other than jeans and hiking boots. People wear flip-flops all year, even when it's below zero. That's white people for you. I can say my R's, so you know I'm from away. But I've heard that 80% of the people living in New Hampshire weren't born here, so I belong, even though I'm just passing through. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, Pat Spaulding is going to tell us a story next. Pat is a writer and a storyteller and 
a majorette with the leftist marching bands. She was born and raised in New Hampshire, and she is staying put. <laughs> Pat's been the MC here at True Tales Radio since January 2014 and still enjoys that role. Her story tonight is about growing up with her brother, Dean. She's been trying to get to this story for about 40 years <laughs> and is finally giving it a shot. It is titled, A Different Sense of Direction. Come on up, Pat. Alrighty, so I was the firstborn. My parents were both very glad for my arrival and I was happy to be the only child for three and a half years. <laughs> then things became different. As soon as my little baby brother Dean hit the scene, he usurped my position in the family hierarchy and demoted me to being second cutest. <laughs> this did not sit well with me, but I dealt with it. I just started spazzing out and having tantrums. And then I was reprimanded for not behaving myself. My mother said, you have a little brother now. You are a big sister. You've got to set a good example and be good to your little brother. Learn how to take care of him. I mean, I was four years old. The only thing I was good at was being an only child. And now that opportunity was gone. But he got a little more interesting when he got out of the crib. And so we played together and shared toys. That wasn't the greatest sharer. I tried to be a good big sister. But Dean was born with a few differences, some minor disabilities. He had a slow eye, which looked in toward the bridge of his nose and had to be corrected with a patch. And he also had bad eyesight. So there were Coke bottle eyeglasses with a patch over it that were anchored to his head with a big elastic strap. So he wouldn't take it off. But of course he took it off. He was only one and a half years old. So now he was outfitted with little splints on his arms that looked like they were made out of tongue depressors and duct tape, so he couldn't bend his elbows, so he couldn't <laughs> reach up to take off the glasses and eye patch. Add to this corrective shoes, great big, heavy leather, heavy-soled shoes that he could kick very successfully with. So that kind of ended arguments about fairness, but when I ran to my mother with my shin, he had, would I get any sympathy? No. It always went to the little mini Frankenstein who's walking <laughs> around the house with his stiff arms and his eye patch and big shoes. And I was reminded that I was the older sister, the big sister. I had to learn how to set a good example, take care of my little brother. OK. So eventually, I went up to school. Dean stayed home. He had his friends. I just, school was a breeze. It was easy. I was socially adept and good at stuff. And then Dean hit school. Didn't work out so well for him. He had dyslexia. So back then, that was not diagnosed. And he presented as a kid who couldn't read on time. And his letters were all backwards. And that he couldn't stay in the lines. And he couldn't spell. So he was categorized as being slow. He was a great kid, happy, and he was not a discipline problem. So he just kind of shuffled along through the system. Teachers didn't challenge him too much. Just keep your expectations low. Well, of course, my mother wasn't going to keep her expectations low for either one of her children. But I was like, yeah, I mean, Dean was great. He had a pretty good sense of humor. We, we you know, got along together. but. I just had plenty of friends. I was socially savvy. I was good athletics, and I, you know, did well on tests, and artists, and school was easy. I don't know why he was having such a hard time. So I kind of accepted that diagnosis. I go off to high school. I am co-captain of the cheerleader. I am student council president. I am captain of the ski team. I am a leader. Dean was coming into high school. He had his own friends, his own life. I go off to college. Now in college, all right, I'm ready for adventure. So I decide I'm going to lead American youth hostel trips on bicycles. I was riding bicycles at that time. Because that way, I could see the whole world on the cheap. I learned how to be a leader and just go places. Signed up to be uh, for leadership school. <laughs> 
And at 20 years old, I got my first gig. I led 13 15 to 16 year old young women around the Cape on bicycles for three weeks. 20 years old. I looked younger than half of them. I saw nothing of the Cape. All I saw were the back of the heads of 13 girls. Head count every minute of every day. When I delivered them back, everyone whole, intact, to their parents, that was the end of leading American youth <laughs> hostel. <laughs> no, not going to do that again. But I still had this need for adventure, travel by bicycle. So the next summer, 21, I decide I'm going to go out west. I'm not going to pedal the whole way, but just pedal around the interesting part. But I don't want to go by myself. Dean, <laughs> want to go? Sure, he was game. Mm -hmm. Now all he had to do was pitch it to my parents. You'd think this would be hard. <laughs> I mean, this was before cell phones, before GPS, before credit cards, before bike helmets. But for some absurd reason, we'd always camped as a family, and they said, okay. <laughs> and my mother, I remember, we were at Logan, we'd packed our bicycles and crates, and she's seeing us both, her only two children, just the two of us, off at the airport <clears throat> saying, take good care of each other tears streaming down her face, and I said, I figured that's her saying to me, take good care of your little brother, so I was like, oh yeah, I'm on it, no worries. We fly and land in Salt Lake City, Utah, unload the bikes, put on the saddlebags and the, that tent, you know, a little two-man, one-man tent, it was too heavy to be two-man, it was a canvas at the time, sleeping bags, all geared up, ready to roll, it's getting dark, we're in Salt Lake City. Well, we're not going to peel off our first traveler's check for a youth hostel. We're not going to start spending money yet. All we need is a flat place to set up the tent, looking around, and, well, there's a median strip. <laughs> it was pretty big, and it hadn't been mowed recently, and the grass was high, and there were some bushes and trees. So we set up our little tent and slept foot to head the way we did the whole time, and we weren't bothered off the next day. We're in Utah, Mormon country. Seemed like every single rest stop, a family of Mormons pulled up and um, asked where our parents were. They said, New Hampshire, do they know you're here? <laughs> oh, yeah, they do. Oh, would you like to come to dinner? No. Well, here's a pamphlet. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they would inevitably ask if they could have my parents' number so I could call up and say we're okay. I gave them the number, and so my parents heard from several Mormons <laughs> in that first few days of that trip. Their kids are fine. And uh, I'm in charge of the maps because I'm the leader. So I'm looking at all these little routes, which were AAA road maps. I think we had a trip tick, but you know, you're looking for all those little red teepees. Okay, that's a tent site. And uh, I see, Chris, we're close to the Great Salt Lake. Must see that. It's going to be great. And that was my idea. <laughs> to get to the Great Salt Lake, you had to basically push your bicycle through a mile of sand. And then you're at of sand and flies descend, biting flies. You know, you would think this couldn't get much more horrible. You're all sweaty and stuck and, yeah. And so I just start railing. I go into my little tantrum routine and Dean is like, yeah, okay, wait, it's not good, but we'll get to the road, we'll get to the road. We get to the road, then we get on the bikes, and maybe we can outrun the flies. So that was our goal, outrunning the flies. Eventually we did, went to um, uh, a camp. I mean, a campsite. That was an example of one of the worst days. But there were beautiful times at Jenny Lake, mountains, you know, Tetons, climbing, good sights, Yosemite, down to um, Idaho Falls. And the whole time, I'm looking at the maps, and okay, we're going this way. Uh, early on, Dean said there was one time, no, I think that's the route. And I said, oh, no, no, no. And of course, 10 miles down, we're backtrack. We go his way. <laughs> Happened once. Happened twice. Third time it happened. I had another meltdown. It was the end of the day. We were out of water. 
I threw my bike down on the shoulder, stormed up a, an embankment, and just sat in the woods, begrudging the day I thought of this trip. This was just a bad idea. I said, blah, 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 blah. And Dean watches me. And he goes to his saddlebags, and he pulls out a little bit of water. He'd saved some for emergencies, apparently. A couple of aspirin. <laughs> he climbed the bank and said, uh, take these. Maybe you'll feel better. So I did, and I did, as I watched my brother go down the embankment, set my bike to rights in the saddlebags and put everything in order. So I went down, climbed on, and then I followed him on the route that he originally said might get us to the campsite, which it did about five miles down. And that was the most glorious, memorable contrast of a day. Because as we rolled into that campsite, <laughs> there were about a dozen vans and station wagons loaded with very big women pulling into the campsite, <laughs> coolers, baskets of food. And they were taking them all out, spreading them on a picnic table. Now they saw us and they said, are you hungry? <laughs> Thirsty? You want something to eat? It's like, yeah. <laughs> and they were the tops club. Take off pounds sensibly. Oh. <laughs> All these women had lost weight and they were celebrating. And so we shared in that event. Went home eventually. It was a good trip. All in all, it was a good trip. And the thing that was really good about it was I remembered um, my mother's take good care of each other. I think she knew something that I had to go on that trip to find out. She knew that with my brother Dean's struggles that he went through when he was a kid growing up, that I never was privy to, I never had struggles like that. He had learned to be very capable at 17 years old of taking care of himself and of his big sister. At the end of that trip, the family hierarchy had evened out. We were equals. I mean, I was still a bossy brat because that's my nature. <laughs> but things were different now. Um, I now trusted my brother's sense of direction more than I trusted my own. And from that time on, when I reach a crossroads in my life, I still ask, what do you think, Dean? <laughs> and I try to follow his lead. Thank you. <laughs> I almost forgot my job. <laughs> Hadn't visited with my brother for a good long time. <laughs> Next up we have Tony Lee. He's an elementary school teacher who lives in York, Maine. Tony's been a local Seacoast personality for at least as long as I've been one, 35 <laughs> years or more. <laughs> He's acted and directed with generic theater. He writes and tells stories, reads poetry, is a sailor, plus does a lot of other very interesting things. In tonight's story, he'll tell about a former fellow teacher and explore the question, what's in a joke? Can a prank be a bridge between two very different people? And if so, who gets credit or blame for the way things turn out? Oh, for Pete's sake. Let's hear Tony's story titled, For Pete's Sake. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Um, this story would probably be better um, April 1st, but this is still April. I mean, it's, a, it's about a prank, uh, April Fool's Day prank. For um, for this fellow, Pete, um, he um, he passed away, and I was I'm reminded I, I went to a funeral for somebody different, but the 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 message was really clear. Like um, there are people in your life that you should tell them, you should tell them that you care about them. That you, and if you don't, it's that's really too bad. So well you. The theme, though, of difference is really, really apt, I think, because um, Peter was different, very different from me. He was 
um, you know the the sandwich large Italian. That's that was that was Peter. He was he was big and loud and and Catholic and um, <laughs> and uh, I was <clears throat> still am uh, a genuine wasp. I uh, grew up in uh, <laughs> New Hampshire. Could pass, uh, but but didn't was really having trouble passing at um, this middle school in Massachusetts, where it was my my f first year, which is very trying. Um, and uh, so I think especially in a middle school, um, ki you know, kids that age are really expert at telling, um, noticing if you've, if you're BSing them or, you, or, or you're afraid. I mean, they oh my God, they they can smell it, and it's, um, and it's really hard to uh, feel like a phony and and uh, and that you're not doing well. And but that's that's certainly the way I felt, and certainly in contrast to. Peter, who was, he'd go down the halls like a rock star, you know, and, and, uh, and just exuding confidence and his, his virility, all of all, it. I'd, I'd be doing um, uh, recess duty, you know, I'd have my hands shoved in my pea coat and my, hand, my feet are freezing, you know, and the slush on the ground. And he's in shirt sleeves, so, you know, throwing, you know, improbable passes to <laughs> adoring uh kids and then um you know he and he'd always talk about it, my kids my kids um he loved his kids ah. and it was mutual i mean they they, they adored him um and i felt just the opposite <laughs> and you know he was on a team of you know the the happy team he was with um with Patrick and, and Claudia and I was I had some other people and it wasn't going so well. Actually, he gave me some advice one time. I, I was griping a little bit and, and I've heard this from other people, but you know it's it's too bad. But it's sometimes it's you know shut your door and enjoy your kids. And when he shut his door, he was really enjoying the kids because he was the next class over and um, they had these walls that you could open up and they were they were kind of, they were kind of shaky and. And his, the walls were like just swaying and banging. He was playing four square in there. Four square. It's, um, it's you know, at his level, I think it's a rough, it's, it's, a, it's a head game and it's intense. And, and the balls would be bashing against the wall and stuff would be flying under the, you know, kinds of, and, and I'd be in there trying to, you know, force these unhappy people to uh, finish a, a mimeo about some, some, Something, and and um, so I you know, I I feel so bad about myself. I'd I'd be in, you know, be in the lock the door and be in the men's room, you know, just in the mirror, just kind of shadow punching, you know, and saying, "Come on, you can do this, man. You you're a good person. You're a good person." And and you know, you, you don't have to take that stuff. And 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 Peter would be just it would be so natural for him. And uh, so, I, I mean, I mean this, this sounds like a, a bromance story, but I, I just, I admired him, and he, he made me feel how different I was. And so, April Fools, I, um, I decided to rig his desk, and um, we had these big, really huge metal desks. They, kind of, they look like aircraft character, air characters, right? And they, and they have, you know, three or four drawers on either side, and then there's, a, there's one over your legs. It's a, it's kind of, it's a narrow thing. And, um, and it, in it, you would have to keep your um, plan book that could be checked and your rank book, which would include a daily attendance figures and stuff like that. So you had to use that drawer. And um, so I rigged his um, to uh, to sort of explode. Well, I, I made a little model. <laughs> uh, can I just show this little model? Uh, because um, this, <laughs> um, it's bigger than the, the, the thing because, you know, in the, this, this trough right at the lip is made for holding pencils and stuff. So it's 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 curved, and um, and th th I made this a little bigger because it's radio. <laughs> um, but but what you, what you and the, and you know I, I have I said in the title that um, you know what's a joke? Well, I I, I use humor sometimes. Uh, 
effectively to 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 throw a line you know a line across to some 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 distance you know but um but a prank that's like a bridge you know you've got to really put some engineering into it and you've got to really care um you got to really work at it and you know if like a bridge maybe you know people will remember it and you know put your name on it i mean that's that's the kind of um legacy I'd like to have. <laughs> Something like this, where I had to get in there really early and you stretch um, big rubber bands across the trough and then with an index card or some piece of cardboard you make a, a paddle that's going to flip. Now the um, the science teacher in me wants me to talk about uh, wants to talk about the potential energy there is of winding <laughs> winding the thing. Make sure it's really anchored, and you keep winding. And any of you have you know flown those little balsa planes with the propellers, you you go through one like one level of twist, and then and then that then there's a second level of kink, <laughs> and then you know three or four levels of kinking until the thing breaks. But before it breaks, you. <laughs> You, you store it up like that. Now, um, this is, believe it or not, um, I really, uh, I, I, I collected a lot of um, things from three-hole punches, you know, those little things, that, because <laughs> that's, that's essential too. And I, I just, just a couple of hours ago, I tried this, and <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I filled this up, and then let it go, and it, it just, it was a huge <laughs> cloud, um, and, you know, I, it would have been a mess. To, and I, I left them at home, and it, it, I'm, I'm glad, because it, it's radio. <laughs> uh, but, but this um, was, this is the idea. And so when, when the drawer is pulled out, it, it releases and... <laughs> <laughs> so great. And... Of course, I didn't. I wasn't able to find out whether um, you know really see it. Of course, and I was kind of waiting to hear you know what happened, and and then I heard him talking about it, and um, he was so happy, and he he was just just busting with with pride because he he thought his kids had done this for him, and you know what a what a sign of love. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't, um, I was disappointed because I really wanted credit. <laughs> so I worked really hard. And, um, and I never, you know, we got, you know, maybe that did bridge a thing because we, we did, we came closer and then he, um, he was, he was, he, he was studying to be a realtor or something. So he, he left like pretty soon. He didn't hang in there with it. And, um, he um so I lost contact with him and it heard that he'd passed away. But um you know, I I I, I wish I'd told him s sort of. I mean, uh, you know, those kids loved him. But they didn't do this prank. I <laughs> <laughs> That's my prank. And um so so I uh, yeah. Um yeah, yeah, I I think that seems truer and truer. There are people, you should tell them. I wish I had. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Got to say, I really missed the, the punch, the uh, confetti, you know, the little, yeah. little punch <laughs> confetti. But. I don't think that the cleanup crew does. <laughs> okay, next up, last up, we have Michael Lang. Mike's been telling stories here at True Tales Radio a few other times. He grew up in Durham, New Hampshire, where he studied outdoor education at UNH. For many years, he worked as both a ropes course facilitator and as a wilderness guide. <sighs> Michael now works through his own small business, the Coyotes Inkwell, as a storyteller and writer. The story he'll share this evening is about how he started volunteering for the New Hampshire Association for the Blind and how that work has turned into the development of an adaptive sports program. Its title is See Through Different Eyes. Are you ready? 
ready for some kickball? <laughs> Nearly two dozen bleary-eyed sixth graders stare back at me, bewildered that any normal human being could have this much energy at 7.30 on a Monday morning. I smile in response and begin to introduce myself and why the New Hampshire Association for the Blind has sent me to Oyster River Middle School to take over their gym class for the week, at least for the sixth graders. As I go through my normal introduction, it's hard to believe I've been doing this for nearly two years. My mind wanders back to how it all began. I had just started volunteering for the New Hampshire Association for the Blind, helping to plan and coordinate programs in the seacoast area. And then one of my coworkers, co-volunteers, looked to me during a meeting. So Mike, we were wondering, this is a very dangerous way for any line of dialogue to begin. <laughs> Any phrase that begins with the word, so, hey, well, do you think? And then follows into, we were thinking, we were talking. This is the point where a wise man should be looking at his watch saying, hmm, the time, yes, hmm, quite. I just remembered, oh, my goldfish is on fire, I have to go. I did not have any witty excuses in mind at the time. And so I let them finish. You've got this program that's going to be happening at the Sacred Heart School in Hampton. We're looking for someone who knows how to play beep kickball and could teach it and, and give these kids a really great experience of what it's like to be blind or to have a vision impairment. We'd really like to find someone, but no one seems to know how to play this game. I didn't have the heart to tell them that I've never played this game. But I had played beep baseball, and I assumed, you know what happens when you assume, that the rules were pretty similar. I, baseball, kickball, how could the adaptive versions be that different? As luck had it, they actually are very similar, which is good because I didn't bother to look up the rules before I went. The next thing I knew, I was surrounded by these teenagers all staring at me as though I knew how to play this game. And I thought really hard about a teacher I'd had in high school who taught me something very valuable. Never, ever underestimate how far you can get with a friendly smile and a well-modulated voice. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, a baseball diamond. Now take away second base. You got that? Now take away the pitcher and the catcher as well, because they aren't needed. Take all the infield positions and send them to the outfield. We like this game to be challenging, after all. This game has been adapted so that someone who is blind can play it. And for that reason, we all wear blindfolds. This is the point where the students freak out. <laughs> but don't worry, things make noise. The ball goes, me, 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 me. The base goes, <laughs> they all continued to stare at me with many, many questions about how this works. When you kick the ball, one of the bases will start making noise. You have to find your way to that base. Now, you don't know if it's going to be first base or third base but you gotta get to the right one. If you go to the wrong base and someone in the field gets to the ball and holds it up, shout, I got it! You're out. But if you get to that base, you've scored a run. So there is no running of the bases and no throwing around of the ball. We divided up, we played. And just when it was about time to go, I brought all the kids back together, all these teenagers at Sacred Heart. What would you think? Was it fun? Yeah, it was fun. Was it hard? Yeah, it was way more challenging than I thought it was going to be. It, it sounded silly and kind of dumb, but wow, it was really hard. Let me ask you one last question. You don't have to answer this. I just want you to think about this. As you go back to class, you just spent half an hour playing a game with your eyes closed, wearing a blindfold. What if you couldn't take that off? What would your life be like? 
All right, see you later. Hope, glad you had fun. <laughs> and so here I am, nearly two years later, at Oyster River Middle School, playing this game, teaching kids what it's like to be blind. The group has just divided in half. We're about to get started. There's a girl in the front of a line of people waiting to kick. I get ready to hand her the ball, and she looks at me. You're a friend of Tony Lee. What? I'm dragged out of facilitator mode. <laughs> well, well how, how do you know? You came into our class. You did storytelling with us. And you played guitar with him at Mohammed Elementary School's Pumpkin Walk. <laughs> yeah, I did. You know what? You're one of his former students. And a little secret, so am I. I jump back into facilitator mode, turn the ball on and hand it to her. We play this game all through their gym period, but this time I leave time to gather all the kids back together in a circle and ask them, describe the game in one word. It was fun, it was hard, it was frustrating, it was, I, I don't even have words for it. These are the normal answers. We talk, and again, before I let them ask questions of me, what it's like to have a vision impairment, I ask them, you just spent half an hour playing a game with your eyes closed. What would it be like if you couldn't open them again? It would be awful. I'd never be able to skateboard again. I'd never be able to play a video game again. How would I learn how to drive? Then one little girl speaks up. I think I'd be okay. The room goes silent. Everyone turns and looks at her. The proverbial spotlight shines down upon her. Well, it would be hard at first, but I think I would adapt. It took me, till I was in my early 20s and legally blind, to learn that lesson. The more I teach, the more I educate and entertain through adapted sports, the more and more I come to realize that we are more alike than we are different. So maybe, just maybe, when you look through the eyes of a stranger, you'll see yourself staring right back. See through different eyes. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot, everybody. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you so much to all of our storytellers for an amazing night, yet again, of fabulous stories. Really impressive. It's amazing. Thanks also to our studio audience who came out and brought so much more life to the experience. You deserve our next class, too. Woo! True Tales Radio will be back on May 31st with the theme Finding Your Voice. We still have room for two more storytellers. If you would like to be one of them, email us, truetales at wscafm.org by May 23rd. That's our cutoff. Um, also in May, we have something special going on. True Tales is going to participate in a collaboration with Long Story Short. Has anyone been to Long Story Short? Some folks here, and I think Kathy's going to be telling that night. They are a live storytelling program as well that happens at 3S Art Space in Portsmouth. Every other month is their pattern. Um, so we've been working for a few months to collaborate with them to sort of showcase the unique styles and talents that each series brings. We have some, some in, you know, we're a radio and TV program, and they don't have that part. Um, we have some, seem to have some different groups of folks who go to them. So we really wanted to bring everyone together. So what we're going to do is on Wednesday, May 18th at 7 p.m., we're going to have at 3S Art Space a long story short, true tales radio night. Uh -huh. Okay, and then at our show, our regularly scheduled program, May 31st, 6 p.m., we'll be here, and they will be here. Long story short, Beth will come 
and bring some of her tellers, and we'll have a split program here. So we hope to see you at both events, and we'll be getting, spreading the word out about both of them as well. So um, check our Facebook page um, for that. What is our Facebook page, Pat? I don't think oh, I you have. Mean, by memory? Oh, never mind. <laughs> Just, you know, well, look for it. Facebook dot something. No. Okay. Yeah, you can do it. Okay, sorry. Um, I should have had that written out. So um, I also want to let you know that if you want to tell a story for True Tales Radio or for any program, and, but you're unsure of yourself and want some help with your piece, Pat and I offer monthly um, storytelling workshops here in this space the first Tuesday of each month, 7.30 to 9. That means the next one is May 3rd. They're free, they're open to everyone, and we always have a really good time. So if you want to come and get some help and try it out and be in a community of storytellers, please come on down. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. I have some thanks to do. Our underwriters for tonight's program are Jan Hansen, who believes in the unique value of having an independent community radio station in the Seacoast. Pat Spaulding, who believes in stories for grown-ups on True Tales Radio and is curious to know, hey, what's your story? And Emily Spaulding, author of Red Clay Girl, who believes that when you share your story, you never know who you might touch. Thanks also to MC Pat Spaulding, promotional assistant and photographer Steve Koval, technical assistant John Nash, and of course producer John Lover. Also to David Frainer for helping us out tonight. Hope he'll come back. Also thanks to Bill Humphreys, Chad Cordner, and everyone at PPM TV for collaborating with us on True Tales TV. So until our next program, uh, May 31st. I'm Amy Antonucci and I thank you so much for listening. We're now going to go back to John Lovering and John Nash to wrap up tonight's program.